All right. Hello. Welcome to the Far Left Show. Today we're talking about uh, the conflict in Kashmir with India. And today we have a guest on. His name is Karandeep. And he is a political science student at UCSD. And he also works for the Bernie Sanders campaign. So welcome, Karandeep. How's it going? Hey, it's, 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 it's been wonderful. Like, Seb, the conversation that's going on in my country like uh you also know that i'm in new delhi right now so uh, like all this stuff happened while i was in india and i live in india so the conscience that's going around like it's uh not too positive because people are usually like convinced by the by the deception campaign that's going around running by that that's being like run by the modi government right now and people are buying into the right wing talking points thank you so much for being on the show by the way i, I really course, appreciate thank you it having me. Yeah, I wanted to ask, like, what what are the right wing talking points about this? Like, what is the Modi government pushing? Yeah, so the biggest one is that taking away Kashmir's autonomy will bring down the level of terrorism in the state, mm. which I disagree with. Like, we can take a deeper dive on that. And the second argument is that by removing Article 370, which was the article in the Constitution which gave Kashmir's autonomy, by taking away Article 370, they are unifying India under a common law, which is also false because technically under the constitution, other than Kashmir, 10 other states have their special autonomous rights. Mm -hmm. So so that's a false argument. People say that, oh, we've completely unified India now. Like, because you have to remember this happened a few yeah. days before the independence day. So people are like, oh, now India is like completely independent because Kashmir is no longer autonomous. It's, it's like a part of India mainland now which is a false talking point because that's not true. And mm -hmm. another line going around is that Article 370, once again, the article that gave Kashmir's autonomy, mm -hmm. was a temporary article in, in the constitution. Like people think that it was supposed to be phased away. But in, uh, if I'm not missing up, mistaking the date, in 2008, the Indian Supreme Court gave a decision which said that the article is now in effect, not temporary. So there's like a bit of a legal gray area there because it said it's in effect not temporary instead of saying it's completely not temporary. But those wow. are the biggest three biggest lies which people are buying into regarding the whole conversation right now. I see. And um, there's also the, uh, is it called the Shima Agreement? The that, Shimla. The Shima Agreement. And Shimla. It's, it's Shimla. 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 Shimla Agreement. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Shimla Agreement basically states that India cannot or that it's a bilateral relationship mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that Kashmir is. Could you go into depth a little bit about what that means? Yeah, so let me give you a bit of historical context there. Before the Shimla Agreement was signed, and I guess it was the, I mean, I'm sure it was the Indira Gandhi government, and on the other side, we have President Pervez Musharraf, mm -hmm. who came through like a military junta, so it's a completely another story, but two com deeply undemocratic leaders signed the Shimla Agreement. And that was in context of two previous wars that Indian Pakistan had over Kashmir. And, and when those wars were happening, the U.S. was like, hey, guys, we can intervene and actually mediate the conversation that we can come to result, so that we can come to result. And that was also the attitude of the United Nations. But after the Shimla Agreement, Pakistan and India both decided that the Kashmir issue is a completely national issue for both the countries. So it can be only resolved through bilateral channels instead of having any outside mediation. So that was the most important decision reached by the Shimla Agreement, which is kind of sad because had the UN been involved or United States been involved, we could have expected a more, you know, a fair shake for the Kashmiri people. Like, mm. not say it would happen right now under the Trump presidency, because, I mean, that guy's, like, not capable of handling anything at all. Yeah. But... If the U.S. or the U.N. had been involved as mediators, we, the Kashmir people would have had more of a say in the whole discussion and the argument. But that's unfortunately not the case because those two governments were deeply undemocratic at the time, just unilaterally decided it without even taking in any input from the Kashmir people that they only they and no one else can decide the fate of the Kashmir people, which is, uh, yeah, that's the biggest takeaway from the Kashmir, from the Shimla agreement. Got it. And um, I've heard that and I think this is more of a conservative view, but that Pakistan has already been, um, they, they've been going against the agreement by keeping military in Kashmir. That's sort I of I mean, a, India can also argue that 
Pakistan is doing the same, but you have to realize like there's a legit a state called Azad Kashmir in Pakistan. So mm. a huge chunk of Kashmir is still under the control of the Pakistani government. And they have a whole legislature, uh, legislative body. They have a state capital. They have a state flag. So a, a huge chunk of Kashmir is taken away by Pakistan, or conversely, can argue it's taken away by India. But it's like no one is abiding to that agreement. It's, it's not like it, it's, in, it's 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 completely within India's right to have Kashmir. So it's a oh. uh, it's a bit of a legal gray area. Except I should clarify the fact that. When Kashmir was seceded to the Indian Union, it was done under the condition that the people of the state will have their own autonomy like for forever. Mm. And the king of Kashmir at the time, who was ruling over a Muslim-majority state, was a Hindu. And he was afraid that by uh, joining the Pakistani state, his power would be slowly phased away and would not be the best choice for his own you know, monarchy. He decided that it would be better for him as a Hindu leader to join India's union. And he brought the Muslim majority state into India under the agreement that they will be always autonomous and have their own uh, legal rights, their own legislature, their own constitution. But all of that was taken away when Article 370 was scrapped. Mm. But yeah, that's just me giving you like a broader context of the whole situation. That does a long way of answering your small question. Yeah, that was a beautifully articulated response as well. Um, I wanted to go dive in a little bit deeper. I think we were, what were we talking about earlier about Modi, sort of the um, the narratives that they're pushing about minimizing terrorism? Yeah, so that's a big one. That's a big one. But the way I view it, like the, the, the whole Kashmir has, the Kashmir people have always wanted self-determination. And of course, we all can understand that, like, it's their land, it's their life, so they should just get to vote on it or at least have a say in the decision making about what's happening to their own land. But uh, the argument made by the right wing in India is that in the 1980s, there were like huge riots which happened in the whole Kashmir state in which uh, the, the Hindu minority was forced, most of the Hindu minority was forced to leave the state. And they say that those elections can never happen. Therefore, like there can never be a righteous self-determination because the Kashmiri people, I mean, I should not put that in here because they're actually Kashmiri people, but yeah. who are no living in Kashmir. Like those people are no longer living in that state. So those people left under the riots, the terrorism, which was happening in the 1980s. And the Kashmiri people never got to vote on their own, uh, their own uh, self-determination because of that. And, that whole thing came back once again in 2007 and in 2008 when there were like widespread protests because um, the Indian government was like recently cracking down harder on the, the freedom movement in, in, in Kashmir. Okay. And those only grew all stronger when a famous uh, rebel leader, like he was a, you know, like a poster child for the Kashmiri rebels, Burhan Wani was gunned down by the Indian government. And we have, we saw huge protests. We saw like students come out on the streets they, they were pelting stones at the at the policemen at, at, at the at the people trying to control the riots, and ever since then, the the rebel movement has only grown stronger, because the more the Indian state clamps down on the public dissent, which wants self determination, the more people's daily lives get disrupted. Like imagine living in a state where like there's a curfew for seven days, there's no food, there's no electricity, you cannot like reach out to your uh, loved ones. I mean, there's still electricity, but in most times, like, it's cut off. You don't have any internet access. You don't have any telephone access. And the, the roads are blocked by the military. So, like, you can imagine living in a state where curfew is being imposed to control those riots will definitely lead to more people joining the rebels because their daily lives have been disrupted by the same thing that they uh, that they were doing, taking part in, which is, which is completely understandable. They want self-determination for themselves. But just by the fact that they're in those protests, the... Rebel movement grew stronger because the Indian state was clamping down harder on those protests. Mm. So we go from 1980, where we're uh, in the 1980s, to 2007 and 8, and then to the death of Burhan Wani. And that's where we see the whole terrorism thing become a stronger uh, narrative and a, a ground reality. Like, there is active rebel movement in Pakistan right now. 
But the argument goes that like now that Kashmir is directly under the state control of the Indian central government, they can uh, have a stronger um, grip over power in Kashmir. But if you ask me, like we saw the rebel movement grow, grow only stronger because the Indian state was clamping down on the people. They were they were pushing down their dissent, and now that we directly put the government in charge of the of the state of Kashmir, people are gonna feel more suppressed more isolated, which is only going to lead to more terrorism. But the Hindu nationalists and the people who were for Modi or the right fingers, they think that just because the strong man Modi is in control now of Kashmir and this is no longer like uh, the people, uh, a Muslim government, uh, autonomous Muslim government ruling over Kashmir, Mm -hmm. terrorism is going to fall down. But uh, I I completely disagree with that analysis. Right. I wanted to ask a, a point of clarification just for myself. Um, you mentioned a freedom movement, a rebel movement, and also just a overarching terrorism. Mm-hmm. Are all those three in the same, but from different perspectives, if that makes sense? Uh, can you, can you uh, explain your question a bit better? Yeah. Um, so the you said there's a freedom movement, which is mm-hmm. essentially uh, Kashmiris in, in Kashmir that want freedom, autonomy. Yeah. Um, and then the rebel movement is is the rebel movement also the freedom movement? Yes. Like so it got used it. to be a more democratic means of protest. It used to be we're gonna go out on the streets and demand a plebiscite. But once in the 1980s the riots happened and the Hindus were removed from Kashmir, the whole conversation completely changed because the Indian government was no longer in a position or, I mean, I would argue it was not even right to hold a plebiscite in that situation because the people who used to live in Kashmir once were were forced to abandon their lands. So let's say if 100 people used to live in a house and 80 of them were Muslims and 21 of them were Hindus and those 20 were forced to leave, you cannot have an election and call it a fair election because those people were forcibly evicted from their lands because there was, there was genuine jeopardy to their lives and they had to do that to like save themselves. But in the 80s, the the Hindus were removed, which made the argument for plebiscite only weaker. And then 2007 and 8, we see a rising rebel movement, uh, an armed rebel movement, which asked for uh, self-determination for Kashmir. Or in some cases, and in most cases, they asked, asked for an Azad Kashmir, which means an independent or a free Kashmir. So some of those rebels want an autonomous Azad Kashmir, or they just want to coalesce to the, with the Pakistani state. So they have a different perspective going at it, but the bottom line is the rebels do not want to be with India. Like they want, maybe they want to be independent, maybe they want to be with Pakistan, but they do not want to be with India. That's what the rebels want. Oh, okay. And so those some extent, or I'm like giving you too much detail. It's confusing. Too oh, I, love it. I absolutely love it. Um, it's just a lot to process because, just from my standpoint, it's a very new issue. Yeah. Uh, I think for a lot of United States, it's finally getting coverage after uh, what India has recently done. And so it's sort of something that it's, we totally have to learn just the history in general. Exactly. Exactly. It's a lot to grasp, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll try to like give you as much context as possible as we go through the whole conversation, because it's like absolutely essential to realize that this is not a one dimensional or a new problem. It's a it's an issue that's been out there in the conversation ever since the establishment of this nation and ever since the Kashmir was um, added to the Indian Union. So yeah, there's a whole lot of history to go through, but even if you want to focus on a smaller frame of time, if you only want to focus on the most recent period when the Kashmir issue has been in the American news cycle, we can completely do that and uh, it'll make more sense to you, but I just feel like it's important context that that needs to be put out there just in the, just for the sake of being completely fair about the whole conversation you know i completely agree and i mean um all these events are not in a vacuum so the history is exactly. much appreciated. um i i'm very curious about india they there were like um leaders apparently that were locked up before this new this what would you call it, this new declaration? Uh, um, it was the scrapping of an article of our constitution. That would be more accurate. Yeah, the, the scrapping of the article. That was, that was 370, you said? 370, yes. 370. Um, and they cut off internet. They, they took all these precautions so that people could not rise up. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Riot again, basically. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that... It's, what they did is that in, uh, in Kashmir, you have two main parties. There's the PDP, the People's Democratic Party, under the leadership of Mehbooba Mufti. And there's the, the National Conference under uh, Omar Abdullah. Mm-hmm. So both of those leaders were logged up under house arrest so that they could not reach out to people or voice their concerns right before the article was scrapped from the Constitution. Uh-huh. And it's a, it's a great threat to Indian democracy because not only did you completely suppress the people, you also took away the voices of their political leaders and you mm-hmm. locked them up as a precaution. But it's a democratic country. Like, if you take an action, there would be consequences. And right. people have the option to, to voice their concerns and to tell them, like, hey, guys, you made a decision without ever asking us. So we have the right as Kashmiris to address what you did to us. But that was completely taken away when they logged up the people and they logged up their politicians as well, mm-hmm. which is completely undemocratic in my opinion. But a lot of people on the right wing or just in general in the country are completely okay with that because I think if those people were like allowed to speak out and if the internet access or the phone access was not cut, um, a lot of people would have come back onto the streets. There would have been like the same kind of riots, the same kind of stone pill things that, that we've seen in the past in Kashmir. So they see that as a precautionary measure. I hear them, but the threat to democracy is a is a bit bigger issue for me than uh, people pelting stones at the at the state militia. You know, it just it's a higher concern. I um I was curious: is this this sort of right wing nationalism is this fueled by xenophobia as well oh, towards absolutely the Bharti Janta Party is. The, that's a party that's control that's in the majority in the parliament right now. Like yeah, all the viewers in the US have to remember that India is a parliamentary democracy, not a presidential democracy. It works more on a UK system than it works on the US system. Mm-hmm. The president is only the head of the state. Is this just like a is this a figurehead like the Queen of England? Mm-hmm. But the the most of the action comes from the prime minister, who's the leader of the legislative bodies. So right now, the BJP, the Bharti Janta Party, is in control of the legislature, and Narendra Modi is our prime minister. And that party has always run more on a xenophobic platform. It's not, it's more of a dog, it's, 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 a, it's a loud and clear dog whistle. It's not completely out in the open. Like, it, it shows, like, in, like, certain issues and certain instances but it's quickly covered up. They, they, they don't want that image to become cemented in the larger national conversation or an international conversation for that fact. But if you look at the roots of the Bharti Janta Party, it came out of an organization called the RSS, which is the Rashtriya Swam Sevak Sangh. And RSS basically talks about defense of the Hindus. It talks about giving Hindus the training and the discipline to like come together as an, as an organized unit. It gives them political education. So the BJP is the political offshoot of the RSS. Narendra Modi, our current president, used to be a member of the RSS. And you have to remember, the guy who shot Mahatma Gandhi was an mm-hmm. RSS member. Oh. So the guy huh. who shot Mahatma Gandhi was mad at him because he was being too generous to the Muslims. Uh, he was being okay. too secular. This is why he shot him. So that's the perspective that the RSS comes from. And the BJP is a political offshoot of the RSS movement. And Narendra Modi himself used to be a part of the RSS and he's infamous for, uh, well, when he was a chief minister of the Gujarat state, under his reign in 2002, there were like massive riots mm. in which about 800 Muslims died. So it's not even critical of a riot. Like if you ask me from a election perspective, it was more of a planned genocide, but no uh-huh. one talked like genocide is a strong word because we think of like genocide in terms of Rwanda or Bosnia or Kosovo where like oh yeah like millions of people have to die before you can call it a genocide but I feel like the definition of genocide is, is a, uh, a gen- the definition of genocide according to the UN is when there's a concerted effort to stop uh, a cultural movement a religious movement or a people group so from that definition it's not hyperbolic to call what happened in 2002 under the reign of Narendra Modi a genocide. So mm-hmm. that same guy who 
oversaw that happening in his own state, where the police was completely complicit with the people who were attacking the Muslims, mm -hmm. became the prime minister. He rose from being the leader of a state, the leader of the whole country, and people were okay with that. Jesus. So the xenophobia is completely clear from what happened in Gujarat. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a deeply xenophobic ideology. And also, ever since the, ever since the founding of the BJP, They've had three main pillars, three main policy pillars. The first one was to take away Article 370, which they did. The mm. second one was to construct Ram Mandir. So Ram Mandir literally translates to the Ram Temple. Ram, uh, Lord Ram is uh, one of the main uh, religious figures in, inside Hinduism. Mm. And they claim that the land on which Ram was born uh, has, a, has a mosque built on top of it. Uh -huh. And... They, they broke down that mosque, there were like huge riots, and the, the, the mosque was attacked. Uh, people uh, broke down the mosque, they, they broke down the structure, and now mm -hmm. there's a huge case going on in, on the Supreme Court about can the Ram Mandir be built on that land? So that's the second issue, a deeply yeah. religiously divided issue, which was the center cornerstone of BJP's policy. Mm -hmm. The third cornerstone of BJP's policy it's a uniform civil code. So India is a secular country. Like different religious groups get to have their different set of laws to a certain extent. But BJP wants to just smooth that over and have the same laws apply to all people in the same sense. That may seem secular on the surface, but you have to realize that Hindus constitute like 80% of the Indian population, 80 to 84%. So if we're going to go with the majority, that means the 14% of the Muslims, the 2% of the Sikhs, the 1% of other minorities, their religious practices will stop, will, 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 will no longer be recognized by law. So those three pillars on which the BJP sought to differentiate itself as a political movement and the, the central three pillars of the BJP on which it became a political party are deeply xenophobic platforms. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. It, it seems like it's primarily to create division, it almost seems, exactly. amongst the people against minorities. Um, exactly. That seems a, a, a definite pillar of right-wing governments um, in a lot of ways. Um, it's always divide and conquer. It's always. always. Divide and conquer. Yeah. Um, do you have any anything else you wanted to talk about specifically about, uh, I guess, anything <laughs> about Kashmir, about what's going on in India as well? Yeah, so this is a deeply troubling time for Indian democracy because a lot of people have given into that strongman image of Modi and they feel like he's a strong leader that the country needs right now. And But we have to realize that Modi is a, he's, he's not dumb like Trump. He's a really smart guy. And the whole reason he did the thing with the, with the scrapping of Article 370 right now was because Indian economy... There were signs that the Indian economy, like the global economy, was going into a recession. Mm -hmm. So not only did he fulfill one major platform of, of its party, he also took away the focus of the people away from the economic recession towards this more xenophobic and divisive issue so that he can like consolidate his own voter base behind a strongman image. So it's a, uh, yeah, the, the whole thing is a threat for Indian democracy and also takes away attention from the the crisis that the Indian economy is about to enter, which just means we will be less prepared when the when the crisis hits us. Got it. And do you have any any recommendations for people that want to learn more about this issue? Yeah, definitely. Like if you go on a news website and it ends with dot n dot India, do not read that article. Like. A lot of this, a lot of the media in India is completely bought out by the, the Narendra Modi government. The right wing government has like a lot of big money interests with which it pleases, and those interests have been able to take hold of the of the media system. So if you're reading mm -hmm. news on India and you feel like, oh, this is an Indian website, this must be a really good source for me to read read about Kashmir from, just take everything they say from a from a word from a perspective of caution. Because yeah. it's more than likely that they have a right-wing tilt. They have a pro-government tilt, which is against what the media is supposed to do. The media yeah. is supposed to be the people who challenge the power, not bow down to power. But a lot, in a lot of cases, that's what the Indian media has been doing. Like, surprisingly enough, I read a lot of articles on this issue 
from mm-hmm. Indian media, also outside media, from international media. Like the best articles that I came across were on foreignpolicy.com, foreignaffairs.com, mm-hmm. which are both center left, center right leaning uh, American foreign policy organizations, and Al Jazeera, which is a news organization partly funded by the Qatari government. So surprisingly, like those organizations which which have a clear bias are giving you more uh correct information a more accurate picture than indian indian media itself does so yeah if you want to research more on the issue just just be careful where you're reading from got it well thank you so much that like opened my eyes so much to just what's going on um I also wanted to talk a bit about Bernie Sanders, if that's all, if that's all right. Are you ready to move on? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm taking this uh, uh, organizing for Bernie summer school thing, uh, with, with, which preps student leaders to become organizers on their campus for Bernie. And uh, like, like the board uh, uh, on your left hand side says, like I, I'm a I'm a huge huge Bernie supporter. Oh. I, oh shit, I don't have any Bernie books with me, but yeah, like if you walk into my apartment in San Diego, you see like the uh, uh, Bernie's book, Art Revolution, is like sitting right behind me. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I'm a huge, I'm, I'm a huge Bernie bro, if uh, uh-huh. that's the correct phrase. Uh huh. Um, and so you're, are you going to start a Bernie Sanders organization? Is that kind of what it's? The, we already uh, have the- one in UC San Diego. Yes. So we have Trends for Bernie 2020, and it's uh, up and running. We're going to go back full swing into action once the quarter starts, and we're hoping to convert as many people as possible, get out the vote, and hopefully elect Bernie as the next president of the United States. 